All they said that we had to do was implement their grand strategy. What did they call for? Dramatic increases in U.S. military spending, regime change in Iraq, putting permanent military bases in the Middle East, even though it would spawn terrorist attacks against the United States, developing a whole new generation of usable nuclear weapons, militarizing space. They talked openly about owning space, controlling space, dominating space, denying space to our adversaries. They called for a missile defense shield that they saw as the key for the United States to be able to intervene all throughout the world, anywhere at its choosing, and that no one would be able to hit us back. They called for the United States again to pull out of international agreements, and very interesting, and maybe this would come back later to haunt them, they laid their hand clear by saying that they would do whatever they could to prevent the creation of the International Criminal Court. The last decade of the first 10 years of the 21st century. The results of these policies were predictably disastrous. The Bush administration had used the terror attacks of 9-11 to create a politics of fear to push forward their disastrous grand strategy. The Democrats were spineless and allowed it to happen. And although many, many citizens took to the streets, many others caved in to the politics of fear and supported a war that would turn out to undermine much of the country's economy. It reminds me of something that Hermann Goring, the, the second in command in Nazi Germany, said before the tribunals after World War II. He said, why, of course, the people don't want war. Why should some poor slob on a farm want to risk his life in a war when the best he can get out of it is to come back to his farm in one piece? Naturally, he said, the common people don't want war. That is understood. But after all, it's the leaders of the country who determine the policy, and it's always easy to drag the people along into warfare, whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or a communist dictatorship. Voice or no voice, the people can be brought along. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. There were many friends of the United States who warned that implementing the grand strategy that invading Iraq would be a disaster. Gwynne Dyer, the historian of war, spoke out and said that U.S. arrogance was about to destroy the international system. He wrote, and almost no one paid attention, quote, the United States needs to lose the war in Iraq as soon as possible. Even more urgently, the whole world needs the U.S. to lose the war in Iraq. What is at stake now is the way we run the world for the next generation or more. And really bad things will happen if we get it wrong. Emmanuel Todd, the French historian who is famous in Europe for predicting the collapse of the Soviet Union, because he said he was looking at the Soviet Union's economy rather than its military power, he made the same prediction for the United States, that the U.S. too would collapse because of its economic weakness. He wrote that the United States had become a problem for the world. He lamented that the purpose of U.S. military policies was now to achieve political, political control of the world's strategic resources. But Todd said the United States suffered delusions of empire. He noted that the real America was too weak to take on anyone except for military midgets. In writing in 2003, he wrote, America no longer has the economic or financial resources to back up its foreign policy objectives. Huge trade deficits with the rest of the world signal that financially speaking, America has become the planet's glorious beggar. It has become the chief predator of the globalized economy. Its dramatic militarization has made it a superpower that is economically dependent and politically useless.
Harsh words like those spoken to a drunken friend determined to drive. The economic crisis that gripped the United States and spread to much of the world as Bush left office confirmed Todd's warning, and Obama inherited this huge mess. Certainly one of the reasons the Obama administration got off to such a bad start was it failed to recognize or at least acknowledge that its real task was to manage imperial decline. The world had changed and there was opportunity if we rejected past ambitions. Acting boldly and effectively to fundamentally change the direction of U.S. foreign policy could, in fact, usher in the great transformation. Now, for the purpose of disclosure, let me tell you that I'm one of those historians who looks at the great transformation through the lens of changes in U.S. foreign policy, and more specifically through the lens of how the nation finally came to challenge the nation's fixation on militarization and war. I believe at the heart of the crisis that led the United States to the brink of destruction were several ill-founded beliefs that were finally challenged. First was the belief in the usefulness of military power. Confusing military power with real strength always sows the seeds of destruction for both those who deliver and receive the brunt of the military violence. The second belief was that the United States could somehow avoid the economic consequences of a militarized economy. One way they tried to do that is they funneled contracts to almost every congressional district. This is beneficial in the same way as getting kickbacks from producing and selling poison to one's friends and neighbors. Many members of Congress and many citizens were complicit in a strategy that ensured widespread political support for excessive military spending in war. Members proudly brought home the bacon while simultaneously killing the capacity to produce hogs. They turned a blind eye to the long-term economic consequences of squandering precious resources on wasteful military spending. Remember, during the last decade, the United States accounted for half the world's military spending and more than, more than half of the world's weapons sales. The third belief that led us to the brink was belief in American exceptionalism. This idea that American uniqueness, our special calling, the special mission was deeply internalized. It was embraced by Democrats and Republicans and many citizens. But it was rejected by most of the rest of the world who saw in U.S. actions a desire for domination, double standards, and arrogance. Thankfully, the U.S. people embraced a more modest narrative as part of the great transformation. So I know you're wondering, what happened? How was it possible in the midst of an economic crisis that followed the last decade, that steps were taken that led to the Great Transformation. 